Dude, nice. um, first of all, I want to say thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to hop on the Live Better Now podcast. As a self-published author, you are obviously someone who I look up to. Miracle Morning, it's all beaten up because I've read <laughs> a few different times. I love it, I also dude. got it on Audible. Uh, nice. It's been an early riser. It was uh, 2016. It was my first year in real estate. I'm in sales like you. You sold yeah. for Cutco, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For yeah, for okay. six years for Cutco, yeah. Cutco. And you uh, got in a crazy car accident. Yeah. And then rose to uh, the top of your field selling knives. Yeah. Wrote The Miracle Morning. Correct me if I'm wrong. Self-published. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be traditionally published this December for the... So I will say this, it's self-published in the United States, but I got introduced to an agent, uh, a literary agent in 2014, I think, give or take. And uh, I had sold about 100,000 copies of The Miracle Morning and um, somebody introduced me, Mike Koenigs was like, dude, have you ever thought about leveraging that to get a traditional publishing deal? I'm like, I don't know how to do that. And uh, he's like, I got the best agent. And so we met with 13 New York publishers. We got nine offers. Um, but none of them made sense financially because the book was doing so well and making so much money self-published that the you know their their offers like it would have been a really nice check. But then I just did some math and I'm like I'd regret this like in a few years for the rest of my life, <laughs> right? So I was like I thought I was like oh man that's a bummer. And uh, the agent said hey our foreign rights department thinks this would do really well overseas. Are you open to us pursuing tradition or foreign publishing? I'm like what does that mean? They said you'd keep all of your U.S. and Canada rights. Nothing would change, and then you would not be allowed to sell it in other countries except through the publishers. They would, they would, they would retain the rights. I go, I don't sell any copies in those other countries. They're like, so then you lose nothing, and you could gain a lot. Yeah. And then now it's been uh, translated into forty-one languages and traditionally published in those other countries. Yes. But for the first time ever in the U.S., it'll be traditionally published. Uh, we finally found the right publisher. And so December 12th, 2023, the updated and expanded edition that I've envisioned for the last decade, um, may like I rewrote every page of the book. So wow. that'll, that'll come out in like six months. So, so that's pretty exciting. Put, you didn't just put 2.0 on it. Yeah. It's to move a couple things around and republish. So it's actually new and expanded. You know, this, this idea of having the miracle morning with the savers, like it's not rocket science, right? Yeah. It's not rocket science. It's you'll know, wake up early have some silence and solitude, drink some water, move your body, and then start banging the phones until your thumbs yeah. bleed, right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, you know, it, I wanted to have a very, like, informal conversation with you. Um, yeah. You know, I, you know it, it's great to, to go through the book and, you know, learn about your story. And I definitely want you to, to tell your story and things like that. But, you know, the, the, the audience, the couple hundred people that listen to this, like, yeah. if you want to learn The Miracle Morning, Go buy the book. Go buy the book. I can't remember how I was introduced to The Miracle Morning, but I read it and I'm like, you know what it was? I've been a 5 a.m.er since like 2016 and nice. I just started reading this until 2019 and it just like reaffirms and reaffirms and reaffirms. Like you got to you gotta have that, that time in the morning. But I want to learn more about who you are right now because okay. I see I, – I was watching a ton of YouTube shorts that you've been posting recently – a lot of stuff about diet, a lot of stuff about family, like you and I, and I'm going to let, give you the mic. I promise you and no. I have a lot in common. It's like, yo, get after it. No excuses, no excuses. It doesn't matter what your situation is. Wake up early, bang the phones, work on your fitness, eat healthy food, continue to cultivate your self-discipline. But tell me my first question, tell me where you're at now. Yeah. You know, obviously making money selling the books, making money doing speaking, have a great family life, right? Continuing yeah. to to scale your business. What are some of your goals right now? Yeah. So yeah. So I am uh, I am married uh, for what what are we at? Thirteen years of marriage, eighteen years together. Um, my daughter uh, is thirteen years old. My son is uh, ten. And uh, big lifestyle change about a year and a half. No, I guess two years ago now. Uh, we moved out from the city, from Austin, Texas, in a neighborhood, uh, and bought acreage uh, in uh, Dripping Springs. So we're on a ranch, and we have we have so many animals; it's crazy. We have so we've we just got a third dog. We've got three turkeys. We've got two sheep. We've got a 38 year old tortoise. We've got um, uh, what do we got? We got three, yeah, three turkey, 25 chickens. We got two horses just recently. So. 
we got, we got like a little ranch farm going on. Mm-hmm. Uh, my wife's selling, she's slanging eggs. <laughs> so she has a little egg business on the side. Um, so yeah, man, that's like that, that's life. And then as far as the mission and the work, um, the miracle morning, I, I quickly realized when I created that and I started sharing it with people, which I, and I shared it for three years while I was writing the book, meaning I would give speeches on it, do interviews on it, where, but there was no book, you know, and I would, I would put out like blogs on it, do video blogs. And, um, I was sharing it as much as I could, but I quickly realized uh, after the book was published that the miracle morning is like it, it, it was making a not just a broader impact in terms of the amount of people it was impacting, but the depth of the impact. I mean, I have emails from people and I mean, at this point, thousands and thousands, there's 30,000 reviews on Amazon of people saying like, this transformed my life in the most profound ways. Like it saved my marriage. It got me off my depression medication. I lost 30 pounds, 50 pounds, 80 pounds. Like, and, and so because of that, for a long time as an entrepreneur, you know, you have the chasing the squirrel syndrome where you're like, Ooh, I should try this and put on an event and da, 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 do all these things. Um, I, I, I finally realized that like the miracle morning is the greatest value that I have to add to humanity, uh, until further notice. And so, I need to go all in on that. And so that's really my mission. It's real simple that if somebody asks me or if an opportunity comes up, if it furthers the Miracle Morning mission, uh, it's a yes. And if it makes me money or does, you know, but it but it doesn't contribute to this mission that I'm on. And the mission, by the way, is to elevate uh, the consciousness of humanity one morning at a time. And, and we can unpack that at any point if you want. But I mean, it's not just a tagline. It's not just a grandiose statement. It's a very clear specific mission that is happening every single day so for example we uh, we we rolled the miracle morning in schools out uh, a gal on my team brianna greenspan who interestingly enough was my coaching client when i created the miracle morning so three years before the book was published she started doing it and um and now she has brought it to over 1300 schools in new york city alone and it's 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 changing um students lives and so anyway so yeah so that's it man my, my work is focused we have the miracle morning movie for those people that don't want to read a book they can start with the movie it's free at you know miraclemorning.com there's a free app there's the miracle morning book series 14 books there's the miracle morning in schools program that i just mentioned that we rolled out um there's the new edition that's coming out you know in about six months so so yeah everything revolves around the miracle morning yeah there's so many questions I want to ask you. First of all, congratulations. And I know this is still just the very beginning for you. And yeah. you're going to reach millions and millions, tens of millions of people, right? Because this stuff works. It's proven. You're results oriented. Like if you wake up earlier and do the things that are in this book, you yeah. will be happier. That's a fact. Yeah. There's no arguing this. Okay. Sure. There's so many questions I want to ask you, but I think the first question, yeah, the first question I want to talk about is elevating human consciousness, right? Mm. So it's like a thing like, I believe that humans, and I want to talk about Americans. I want to, I want to, let's okay. talk about just Americans. Okay? okay. I think Americans need this more than ever right now. Mm, $11 completely. trillion dollars of consumer debt. 80% of Americans can't cover a $400 expense, right? People, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of people that are relying on the government to bail them out of $10,000 of student loan debt. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, obviously, your know, rent is expensive. Eggs are expensive. Everything's expensive, right? You just got to work twice as harder to make the same amount of money. And this yep. is the reality of the situation. Like, no one can disagree with what I'm saying. Are the numbers, like, a little off? Yes. You know, I'm not naming the perfect numbers. Just making them kind of sure. vague. But I believe that as far as, like, elevating human con- consciousness or whatever term you use is more important than ever right now because everyone is just so obsessed with things that do not matter. What yeah. are your thoughts? Yeah. Well, well I, one thing I want to say, you mentioned, you talked a lot about the financial challenges that people are facing right now. And, and I, I, and I, before I let, we'll go into human consciousness, but I just, I want to, I don't want to skip that and I'd probably forget to come oh, back to it. But the miracle morning I created in 2008 when I was at rock bottom, like financially. So the U S economy had crashed and I crashed with it. I was like you, I was a life coach at the time. I was a sale. I did business coaching. I coached entrepreneurs primarily. Um, and I lost over half of my clients because the economy hit them and then they couldn't afford to pay me. And so, uh, the ripple effect was I couldn't pay my mortgage and I, my house was foreclosed on by the bank and I had bought it a year and a half prior. I thought I was like living the dream or I was living what I thought was the dream. And, uh, and I got really depressed. I got really, I felt hopeless. Nothing worked. 
and the Miracle Morning was the solution. And within two months of doing the Miracle Morning at the height of the Great Recession, I more than doubled my income. And again, the economy was getting worse, but when I got better, my results got better, my income got better in, in, in parallel. Um, my depression went away and I went from being in the worst shape of my life physically to committing to run a 52 mile ultra marathon because I hated running. And I thought, what better way to force myself to really grow and evolve beyond who I've been in the past. And so I'm sharing that because I always thought, man, when the next recession hits, cause you know, we go in roughly nine to 11 year cycles and this one, yeah. they bailed us out a little longer. Yeah. But, uh, well, speaking we're of at 15 years now, so they actually, yeah, they, they pushed this one a little overdue. Yeah, it were overdue, but but I knew it would come, and I thought, man, I'm, I'm I, I I will be really emphasizing that story because you know people feel hopeless and and they powerless, and that's how I felt. And it's like, no, if you focus on becoming the person that you need to be and developing the qualities, the capabilities, the mindset, the habits, the strategies, the knowledge to increase your income in any economy, you can increase your income in any economy, and I'm I'm living proof of that. Yeah. Um. The, 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 in terms of elevating human consciousness, so the original mission when I published The Miracle Morning was change one million lives one morning at a time. And the reason I chose that is because I saw, okay, The Miracle Morning is changing people's lives. Um, and then I kind of thought like, what's the biggest number that I could wrap my head around? And it was one million. I'm like, I don't know if I could ever reach a million people, but 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 that that that's it. That'll give me a target to shoot for maybe for the rest of my life, right? And uh, and it took six years for the Miracle Morning to to sell a million copies, get in the hands of a million people. And then I was like, oh, okay, we achieved the mission. I I, I can't, you know, it happened in six years. That's amazing. What I need a new mission. And and I put a lot of thought. Originally, I'm like, how about change one billion lives? That was the original like my my first iteration. I'm like, nah. I'm like, I I want it to be to be more meaningful, to be deeper, to be, to be more substantial, more significant, Quality, not quantity. Yeah. And, and so I started really paying attention to what's happening for people that do the miracle morning, right? On the surface, the results, they're losing weight, they're making money, yada, yada, yada. But I thought, why is that happening? And I started studying human consciousness. Um, I started oh, I'm drawing a blank on his name. The guy that wrote the books on on elevating consciousness, uh, Eckhart Tolle. No, 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 no. Um, oh, they're on my shelf back here. Uh, anyway, it, it'll come to me at some point. I don't know where they are. Um, but anyway, there's a a guy, uh, like David, 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 right? Um, anyway, all right, I'm just gonna keep going. Uh, <laughs> it just kills me. I, I quote this all the time. I can't believe I can't remember. His, I'm blanking on his name. But anyway, so I started studying human consciousness, and essentially. Uh, there's a scale of human consciousness that was written by this author who I am blanking on. Um, and he actually quantified it from zero to a thousand. And it was levels of consciousness or states of consciousness under 200 are states like fear and guilt and shame, right? These are states that people are in. And when you're in those states, you, you don't think clearly, you're unhappy you have low self-esteem, you have low self-confidence. And then the higher states, I, I believe 200 is the state of courage. That's when you finally have the courage to go beyond these lower states of consciousness. And then the states elevate, you go through love and gratitude and um, the highest state of consciousness is enlightenment. And enlightenment is at 700 or above. Now, that word enlightenment is a very uh, undefined or, or multiple multiple definitions where if you ask someone to define enlightenment, uh, if you asked 100 people, 95 of them would say, I don't know, <laughs> probably, right? Um, like, I don't, I'm not really sure, you know? And then, uh, and then, and then the, you know, the four or five that answered, they would give you five different answers. And the way that I define enlightenment is in the simplest term, it's, inner freedom. So if you've achieved a state of enlightenment, and to me, it's it's not a destination, it's an ever evolving and changing state of being. So you, you get to a place where you are in somewhat enlightened, but then, but, but, but maybe you're 1% enlightened, right? So you didn't achieve enlightenment. And then to me, to get to a hundred percent enlightened, that'd be, that'd be the rest of your life. Because at 99 years old on your deathbed, there's still more potential within you. You could still learn something new. You could still grow. You could still elevate your consciousness. So 
elevating consciousness in the simple terms, right? And essentially elevating consciousness is how you move in the direction of enlightenment, right? States of con David Hawkins, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> David Hawkins uh, is the the father of like a, the writing about states of consciousness. He defined the the scale of consciousness from zero to a thousand, and elevating your consciousness toward enlightenment is what we're talking about, right? So here's how to understand states of consciousness. Most of us pursue emotional states, right? I want to be happier. That's an emotional state. And I don't want to be, I don't want to feel bad. I don't want to be fearful and scared and depressed and angry, right? These, these lower states of consciousness. Um, the, the way to think about this is emotional states, which is what most human beings are always pers in pursuit of, right? Getting away from painful emotional states and pursuing pleasurable emotional states. Here's the problem with that. If you're playing that game, it's emotional states are short-lived and fleeting, right? So let's say you're like, okay, I pursued a state of happiness. So I did some things that made me happy and I, I set my life up so that it wasn't painful and, and now I'm making money and, and now I feel happy. Well, if your circumstances change, right? If all of a sudden you experience the death of a loved one or you go into bankruptcy or your, your, your spouse leaves you, right? If all of a sudden your circumstances, which what your emotions were dependent on, if they change, you can go from being in a positive emotional state to a painful emotional state, a self-destruct emotional state instantly. So if you look at it that way, you realize, okay, well, well, if I'm playing this game of pursuing positive emotional states and avoiding negative ones, it's not a very stable game. It may not be sustainable. So then you go, okay, well, if, if emotional states aren't really the optimal objective and they're part of it for sure, don't get me wrong. I want to be happy as often as I can be. But what I found is that states of consciousness are fundamental. They're rooted. They're underneath the emotional state and they allow you when you reach enlightenment, when you move toward enlightenment, as I said, I define that as inner freedom, which I would define as the freedom to choose your experience in any given moment. Meaning, let's say something terrible happens to two different people. Person one says, oh my God, this is horrible. I don't deserve this. I'm a victim. This isn't fair. My life is over. I'm unhappy. I'm scared. I'm depressed. The exact same thing happened to person two and they go, well, I can't change this. So what's the point in allowing myself to be scared and depressed and live in a horrible state of inner turmoil? I'm going to choose to be at peace with my life exactly as it is. I'm not happy this happened, but it's more powerful than that. I live in a state of unwavering inner peace. Mm. So no matter what happens to me, my emotional states might change. I might go from being happy to being upset. But underneath those emotional states is a state of consciousness that is inner peace or inner freedom. So no matter what happens to me, you really can't shake me, bro. <laughs> like you, right? Like I'm at peace with life exactly as it is. And from that place of peace, here's the beauty of that, Zach. Peace or inner freedom or inner peace, these are all words described or enlightenment describing the same state of consciousness. When you're in that state, that state is emotionally neutral. When you have developed, uh, elevated your state of consciousness to one of inner freedom, of, of peace, unwavering inner peace, it's emotionally neutral. And from that place of emotional neutrality, you can now choose consciously. Like if you're in a fear state, you can't choose. You can't, you can't consciously choose. It. Like you're in fear. When you're in pain, you can't think clearly, you're overwhelmed, you're scared, you're et cetera, right? And so, but when you achieve this state of consciousness that is inner freedom, inner peace, enlightenment, you can choose the optimal emotional state that would serve you in any given set of circumstances. Mm -hmm. Okay, so easier said than done. <laughs> it's my first thought, right? hundred percent. Like, I'm glad like, you said that. Yeah. Right, like, here's how telling us exactly what we need to do with our thoughts, exactly yep. what we need to do with our emotions, yep. exactly how we should exercise our free will to apply this to our life so we can be like Buddha, Jesus Christ, and, and Marcus Aurelius and be enlightened, right? Yep. Yep. So easier said than done though. So what are some of the things that you do, you know, cause I look up to you, like you're, yeah. you're, you don't know it, but you are my mentor. 
right? Thank you, I brother. I'm honored. How? Like your your life as far as sales, self publishing a book, being a coach, and just your energy and your attitude on life. Like it is like I can't think of, and I'm being a hundred percent sincere and honest and, and genuine and authentic. Like I can't think of someone else who I want to like model my lifestyle than mm. you. It's not Tony Robbins. It's not Brian Tracy. It's not Jim Rohn. It's not Jack Canfield. Right. It's you, dude. I, I really mean that. So like, thank you. That means a lot, man. Cause I, I look up to all those guys. I'm sure you do too, but that I don't, I don't take that lightly, Zach. Thank you. No, I pre, I, yeah, of course, dude. So like, how do you do all the things that you just said? How do we get there? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so it's obviously, it's not a snap your fingers kind of thing, but it actually can happen faster than you imagine. And, um, and I'm going to share with you things that you can apply today, right now, today, and and I'll, I'll 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 back this up with a story of an example of somebody that went through something horrific. Her dad committed suicide when she was 17. She saw me speak when she was 27. She applied what I'm about to teach you, and a couple weeks later, sent me a tattoo with three words that I'm about to share on her wrist. Said yesterday was the 10 year anniversary of my dad's death. I've spent the last 10 years deeply depressed and feeling like a victim. And when you taught me the five minute rule, which I'll teach you in a sec, and the three words I'm about to share with you, she said, it's the, the last few weeks is the first time in 10 years that I'm at peace. You, you, you've made me realize I'm not, I wasn't in emotional pain because of my dad's death. I was in emotional pain because no one ever told me there was another option. No one told me that I could choose to be at peace with him being gone and then move on and live my life. So I share that I'm sure I just shared the story before the lesson because it's to realize that someone could have lost losing the most horrific person in her life, being depressed about it for 10 years, learning what you're about to learn. Two weeks later, she 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 completely transformed her experience of her father's death. You can apply this to your current situation, to past trauma, and to everything that ever happens to you for the rest of your life, no matter how challenging it may be. Um so when I was 20 years old. Uh, I was driving home from a Cutco conference, right? You know this story, Zach. Uh, and I was in a Ford Mustang. My first, I had bought my brand new, like my dream car at 20 years old, three weeks prior, driving the Ford Mustang. It's 1130 at night. And a drunk driver got on the freeway going the wrong direction, coming head on straight at my car. I don't remember seeing the headlights. I don't remember what even happened. I There's about two weeks of my life that I have no memory of. I only know what I'm about to share from eyewitnesses, my best friend that found me at the scene of the accident, police reports, et cetera. Um, around 11.32 p.m., this four, full-size Chevy truck coming down the highway at 80 miles per hour crashed head-on into my Ford Mustang at 70 miles per hour. And instantly, the front of my car was destroyed, the windshield shattered, the airbags exploded, knocking me unconscious. My car spun off the drunk driver, and the worst was yet to come because I spun in front of the car behind me and they crashed into my driver's side door, my, my door just to, you know, three inches from my left shoulder at 70 miles per hour. And instantaneously, they, cr it, they crashed into the door. The door crashed into my body. The metal broke, twisted, snapped, and so did my bones. And instantaneously, I broke 11 bones. My femur, the biggest bone in the human body, broke in half. I broke my pelvis in three sections. I broke my arm behind my bicep in half. I shattered my elbow, severed my radial nerve in my forearm, shattered all the bones around my left eye to the point where it's now made of metal plates. My ear was almost completely severed and the top of the roof buckled and sliced a V into the top of my head. And unable to withstand the pain, thankfully, I went into a coma and uh, I began losing a lot of blood. And it took the paramedics and the fire department uh, almost an hour to use the jaws of life and cut me out of the car. And when they did, I had lost so much blood, blood that I bled to death. And I was clinically dead for six minutes as they rushed me onto a medevac helicopter, busted out the defibrillators to shot me back to life, put, hooked me up to an IV to give me blood and, and, and resuscitated me. And thankfully they didn't give up after a few minutes because six minutes later, I took my first breath. I was rushed to the hospital spent six days in a coma. And when I came out of the coma, the doctor said I would never walk again. Now, if you can imagine waking up in a hospital and going like all groggy, right? Like what, where am I? Why does everything, why is my arm hurt and my leg hurt? And like they're throbbing and, and my left eye is bandaged and my ear, I can't hear out of my left ear. Like, you know, just confusion. 
And my mom and dad are, you know, trying to, of course, figure out like what's the best way to tell your son that he's been in a head on collision with a drunk driver, broken all these bones and never going to walk again. And so I had to process that. And after I was awake for a week, the doctors called my parents in and they said, we're concerned with Hal. Physically, he's made it through the worst because I had flatlined twice more during that coma. Uh, So I was in critical condition and they said, physically, he's made it through the worst. He's stable. He should be with us for a long time. But mentally and emotionally, we're concerned that he's in denial or delusional because they said, every time we interact with your son, he's always smiling and laughing and, and telling jokes and making us laugh. And they said, frankly, that's not normal. They said, that's not normal for a 20-year-old young man who's got all these broken bones and scars and being told he's never going to walk again. So we believe that that your son is in denial. He can't face reality or he's delusional because of the brain damage or something. And we need you to talk to him and get to the bottom, get him to admit to how he's really feeling. He should be sad, scared, angry, or depressed. And they said, find out how he's really feeling so we can work with him through the psychiatrist and figure out how he's really feeling and and begin the emotional healing process. And so my dad comes in and he expresses the doctor's concern. And he's like, he's like trying not to cry. He's, you know, I mean, I can only imagine as a dad now what my parents went through is worse to me than what I went through. But he tells me the doctor's concerns and he says, Hal, I know you're a positive person, you know, in general, but um, it's okay to, you know, the doctor said you should be, it's normal to be sad and scared and angry and even depressed. And I wouldn't blame you. Nobody blame you. I think it's important to get in touch with those feelings. How are you really feeling? And I really went inside my, you know, I, 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 I kind of looked up and to the left and I went, huh, am I sad? Am I scared? Am I angry? Am I depressed? And I shook my head. And I looked at my dad and I smiled and I said, dad, I thought you knew me better than that. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, remember, I live my life by the five minute rule and the can't change it philosophy. And he said, remind me what that is again. And I think I told him, I think I joked. I said, God, you, I've told you and mom this so many times. You'd be so much happier if you would listen to me. Um, And he said, just humor me. Tell me what it is. And it was something I had learned in my Cutco sales training a year and a half prior And again, this is what I just mentioned a few minutes ago, transformed this girl who lost her father to suicide, okay? These two strategies, the five-minute rule and the can't change it philosophy. Here you go. I said, and I told my dad, I said, dad, I learned this in my Cutco sales training, which is simply said that when something bad happens, right? Air quotes bad, because it might actually be good in the long run, but something that is disappointing, that's discouraging, you fail at something, you set a goal, you don't reach it. And in the in the context of sales, it was like your customer cancels the biggest order you ever had. And you know, you're like, you're like ready to quit because you there's so much other, and that was the context, by the way, that I learned this is that sales is a microcosm for life in terms of adversity. My manager said, or my mentor said, hell. Um, The average person experiences failure every once in a while. You're going to fail day after day after day. You're going to set a goal for the day. You're not going to reach it. The next day you might reach it, but you might not reach the next three days. You're going to fail for the week. You're going to get rejected. The the average person gets rejected occasionally. You're going to get rejected over and over and over on the phone, in person, right? And as he's telling us, I think, you know, we're all going, "Uh, I don't know, what did I sign up for? But he says, Here's the thing. If you can succeed at sales and and learn how to manage that frequent of adversity, you can succeed at anything. You will build a level of resilience to to respond to adversity that most people will never, ever even have the opportunity to build. And I'm like, okay, that sounds good. Okay, keep going. And he says, but you need a strategy. And the strategy is called the five-minute rule. He says, when something goes wrong, it's you should feel your emotions. You should never suppress your emotions. You should never go, no, 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 I'm a big boy. I'm a whatever, whatever. I, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to sweep it to the side and move on. He said, give yourself time and space to fully feel your emotions. But he said, there is no value and it's completely counterproductive to extend feeling sorry for yourself, feeling angry, feeling resentful. You know, you name the negative emotion. He said, People suffer 
over an extended period of time. A lot of people are suffering over things that happened when they were children. It's not happening anymore, but just the thought or memory of what happened causes them to experience emotional pain. So he said, when something goes wrong, set your timer on your phone for five minutes. Literally, it's a very tactical strategy. He said, set your timer for five minutes and that, and allow yourself five minutes to feel your emotions and really feel them like bitch, moan, complain, cry. You know, if you got to punch a wall or a pillow or whatever, like feel them fully, like fully express. He said, but when the timer goes off after five minutes, you say three very simple but powerful words. Can't change it. It's a simple acknowledgement that I can't change what happened five minutes ago. So there's no value in wishing it didn't happen. There's no value in continuing to feel sorry for myself. There's no value in resisting reality, right? He said the only logical choice at that point, you have really two choices. Number one, you can continue to be miserable for as long as you want. And some people, like I said, suffer for decades over things they can't change. He said, or you can say, can't change it. Therefore, I accept it fully. And I'm now going to focus 100% of my energy and attention and time and behavior on what I can change. So I'll tell you, when I learned this, Zach, my first response was what maybe a lot of other people's is, is, dude, five minutes isn't very long. Like, could I get like a five hour rule, maybe like a five day rule? Like, I'm not going to get over it in five minutes. And here's, and that's what I thought. And here's what happened. I, the first time I used the five minute rule was like within the first couple of days, somebody canceled their appointment and actually, no, no, I'm sorry. I drove 45 minutes to an appointment and they no showed me. Right. So I was like, are you kidding me? Like, so my mind, I'm like, I set my timer for five minutes because that's what I was taught to do. And I start just stewing. I'm like, dude, how rude. Like you had my phone number. You could have called me. You left me a post-it note on the door saying we don't want knives. And I was like, like so disrespectful, so rude. So in my head, and then I'm thinking, dude, I, I, this is a wasted appointment. Like I'm working hard to a goal. Now I can't hit the, I'm not going to hit the goal. Like I'm going to hit the goal. And, and so I'm just, I'm going on and on and on with all these stories in my head. And the timer, you know, seemed like it was five seconds later, the timer goes off. And I was vindicated in my thought that, yeah, I'm still pissed, dude. Like five minutes is not enough. And I, I hit snooze on the timer and I continued to stew in my emotions for five more minutes. I did that like three or four more times. And I was like, five minutes is not enough. But what happened is I eventually started like, I'm like, okay, well, I guess I can't change. Like eventually I'm like, I can't change it. This sucks. I got to move on. Here's where the magic. No, no, no. I'm, I'm going to call this the miracle happened, Zach. It was a couple weeks into the career. Um, I was working uh, toward this huge goal. And on Sunday morning, orders are due Monday morning. Sunday morning, I was $2,000 away from the goal. And I, uh, I, had, I had no appointment scheduled. And like calling people on a Sunday morning is not recommended. Um, and getting them to say, yeah, come over today and show me knives. That's what I had planned for my Sunday. Right? It was not easy. I ended up getting two really sweet families that agreed like, sure, come on over. We're not doing anything. You seem nice. You're for, you know, Sherry, their friend had recommended them. And so I go over the first appointment buys nothing. And so the next appointment, I somehow had to sell $2,000 when our biggest set was $750 or 725. So I'm like, I don't even know how I'm going to do this. I got to sell her three sets, like maybe two for gifts. I don't know. Okay. The woman buys $2,300 from me. And I, 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 I surpassed the goal for the week. I'm on cloud nine. I call my manager. I say, Jesse, dude, I hit my goal for the week. I just saw this woman just bought 2,300. She bought a set for herself, a set for their vacation home and a set for her, for her fam, her parents. I'm like, you know, this woman obviously had a lot of money. Like it was the perfect scenario. He said, Hal, not only did you hit your goal, that makes you number one for the week out of our entire team. You're the number one rep in the office. You're going to get recognized at the weekly team meeting. I hang up the phone. I am on, I call my parents. I'm like, mom, dad, I'm number one, right? That night, like five hours later, it was like 9.02, I think. My phone rings and it's the woman from that day. I had spent the last five hours celebrating. And she calls and says, hey, my husband just came home. He was really upset that I spent that money on knives without asking him. I have to cancel the order. 
no. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Like, like my heart sinks into my stomach. I'm like, this can't be happening. You know, like I, this was in my mind cemented, you know, I had already spent the money. Like, what am I going to buy with this? Right. And I'm like, why well, am I, I try to like, you know, politely talk her back. I'm like, well, wait, remember you have the 15 day guarantee. He can try it. If he doesn't like it, you can send it back. Like, can you at least try him? You loved him. He'll love him too. No, not a chance. And so I like intuitively, instinctively, I set my timer for five minutes and I'm like, you have to be kidding me. Oh, and I go, what am I going to do now? You know? And I'm like, well, I guess the only thing I can do is, you know, I, I can accept this. I can move on. I can make calls in the morning. Like this sucks, but there's nothing else I can do. Cause I had been training for two weeks to accept the things I couldn't change. And Zach, this is where the miracle manifested. I picked up my phone. And I looked at it and I had four minutes and 32 seconds left. Okay. And I went, what's the point in being upset for four and a half more minutes when I could just say, can't change it now, accept my reality exactly as it is, put the phone down and go enjoy the rest of my night. And in that moment, that was an example of elevating consciousness. Mm. I became aware, my conscious, I became conscious that, oh, I'm in control of my mental and emotional state based on whether I resist reality and wish it didn't happen or I accept reality exactly as it is. I could do it for five, I could resist reality for five minutes, but what's the point? I go, and, and this, I remember it very clearly in my apartment. I said, dude, I'm gonna try the five second rule. Get, let, let me drop an F-bomb or whatever. Like, let me, let me groan or punch something, whatever. Mm -hmm. But I'm gonna try a five second rule. And literally from that moment of my life on, I just, my realization was my objective is to get to, can't change it as fast as I possibly can. And so back to the moment in the hospital with my dad, I reminded my dad of the five minute rule. And I said, dad, I can't change that. I was in a car accident. I can't change that. I broke 11 bones. And if the doctors are right and I never walk again, then I can't change that I'll be in a wheelchair the rest of my life. But guess what I can do, dad? I can choose to be the happiest, most grateful person I've ever been while I endure the most difficult time in my life. And if I'm in a wheelchair the rest of my life, I promise you, dad, I've already thought through that possibility. I'm not accepting it yet. Like I've, ac I've accepted it, but I'm also committed to trying to walk again until proven otherwise. I'm at peace if I never walk again. But I said, dad, I'll be the happiest, most grateful person you've ever seen in a wheelchair because I'm in a wheelchair either way. So what's the point in allowing unchangeable circumstances to dictate my internal state? I get to choose that. And if you're listening to this right now, what's your wheelchair? What is the unimaginable or even not even, not even unimaginable, the difficult circumstances that you've had in your past that you're dealing with right now that you're afraid of or that are on the horizon for the future and because we've been conditioned, this is a big one. We've been conditioned to think when good things happen, I feel good. But when bad things happen, I feel bad. Therefore, I'm not in control of how I feel unless I can control the circumstances. And what I'm offering you is a new paradigm. No matter what happens, I choose to feel however I want to feel. And I don't think anybody wants to feel bad. You wanna be at peace. You want to be happy. You want to be joyful. You want to be optimistic. You want to be grateful. It all starts. You ask the question, how do you go from zero to enlightenment, from zero to inner, from inner turmoil to inner freedom? The first and the most crucial step is going from resistance, wishing things were different that are out of our control, past, present, or future, to accept reality exactly as it is. And the five minute rule is the bridge from resisting reality to accepting reality. And those three words can't change it are the key that unlocks the door to step through it, to be in a place of complete inner freedom. Dude, so powerful. So powerful. W was that a keynote right there? Did I just- yeah, I think so. I think so. It needs Edwards to be. You know, send me this recording because I think we need to- <laughs> No, you're welcome for allowing <laughs> you to practice your next keynote. Thank you. Podcast. Good luck it out, brother. Okay. Dude, you yeah. gave me so much fucking energy there. It would be wrong of me to continue asking more questions. And that was beautiful. There, that was a, that was a keynote. That was like a, a $50,000 keynote, man. <laughs>
Yeah, no, thank you. I, I mean, I, I felt it. Like I was like, the way I explained that was high level. So that was great. I like didn't want to interrupt you, dude. I was like, I have so many like things I want to say. I'm like, just, just shut your mouth.